Jesus said to Nicodemus, The light has come into the world. In the name of the living God, who is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Every major world religion uses visual images and symbols to express its identity. Images that evoke responses among both its own believers and those who affirm other faiths. I was delighted to be invited by James, your chaplain, to contribute to this series of sermons on works of art, and I'm pleased to do so in this epiphany season. As we continue to marvel at the mystery of the Incarnation and to rejoice at the manifestation of the infant Christ to the Gentiles, I want to reflect on ways in which we may find epiphanies in our own encounters with visual representations of faith. The work of art that I've chosen is the so-called Frank's Casket, a whalebone box about eight and a half inches long, seven and a half inches wide and four and a quarter inches high. It was probably made in early 8th century Northumbria, possibly at one of the communities associated with the controversial Bishop Wilfred, who died in 710. At some unknown time, the casket was taken to Europe, and an English antiquary, Augustus Franks, bought it from a Parisian art dealer in 1859, later giving it to the British Museum. Previously, it had belonged to a family in a small town in the Auvergne called Ozon. They had used it as a sewing box until a son of the family broke the whole thing apart, tearing off its silver fittings in order to buy a ring. That accounts for the gaping hole that you can see in the middle of the front panel where the lock once was. Deliberately enigmatic, this three-dimensional riddle presents a number of puzzles to the interpreter, some easier to solve than others. As Ian Wood has observed, few surviving objects from this period are so self-consciously clever as the Frank's casket. Its designer created it for a highly educated audience, one knowledgeable about mythology and history as well as Christianity, literate in both Latin and Old English. The lid and the four sides of the box depict narrative scenes from different sources. The front panel, which faces you in the image you can see and to which I'll return, combines a story from Germanic mythology with an instantly recognisable biblical scene. A story from Roman history appears on the left-end panel, where the twins Romulus and Remus are being suckled by a she-wolf. The back panel depicts the sack of Jerusalem by the Roman emperor Titus. Interpretation of the right-hand end and the lid has proved more difficult, but they probably refer to northern mythologies. Bilingual inscriptions identify the scenes for those able to read the Roman and runic scripts. Let us look more closely at the interplay between word and image on the front panel, starting with the runic inscription, which frames the two different stories depicted in the centre. Fish flodu ahof. The fish raised up the seas onto the mountainous cliff, or the flood cast the fish up onto the cliff. The terror king became sad when he swam up onto the shingle. The final two words of this inscription, Hrones barn, whale's bone, are separated from the rest of the text. They identify the material from which the casket was made as whalebone, and so they answer the riddle posed by the inscription as a whole. The beached fish on the mountainous shore, the terrifying king of the ocean, is a whale. The Anglo-Saxons knew the story of Jonah, of course. Those who lived on the coast also knew about whales, which are mentioned by Bede in his description of the island of Britain at the start of his ecclesiastical history. The image on the left depicts a legendary tale of violence and revenge. Wayland, a skilled smith, was imprisoned on an island and forced to work for a wicked king. Plotting vengeance, Wayland killed the king's sons and made cups out of their skulls. In this image, he gives one of those cups filled with drugged beer to their sister, Bead Beadohild, whom he will go on to rape and make pregnant. On the right... Wayland's brother wrings the necks of captured birds and plucks their feathers. 
Wayland will make wings from these to fly away from his island prison. Well known in Anglo-Saxon England, this brutal story has nothing to do with Christianity. Let's turn, perhaps with relief, to the image on the right-hand side of the casket's front. Three men, shown in profile, each bearing a gift, are approaching a seated woman who has a child on her knee. Here we're on more familiar ground. This is the Visitation of the Magi, identified by the incised runic inscription reading Magi, just to the left of the rosette-shaped star with 13 spokes. The first wise man, kneeling, holds out a chalice filled with gold nuggets. Behind him, the second stoops with a chalice burning incense. The third stands taller, holding a branch denoting myrrh. The arrangement of the figures, descending in height from left to right, draws our eyes to the infant Christ on his mother's lap. Here is the light come into the world, of which Jesus spoke in our reading. God's Son sent not to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The mother and child at Bethlehem sit not in a stable, but inside an elaborate arched building, where each appears inside a nimbus, a cloud-like halo. The incarnate Christ looks almost as if he's still inside his mother's womb, in an image that stresses Mary's role as Theotokos, God-bearer, mother of God. We might note the contrast between the empty temple on the reverse of the casket, overthrown by Titus's army, the sanctuary gaping and bare, and Christ enveloped within Mary on the front. The nimbus around Christ makes him resemble a Eucharistic host. The round objects on the ground in front of the Virgin appear to be bread. If we recall that the place name Bethlehem means house of bread, here we see the living bread came, that came down from heaven, the bread of life and salvation. How should we read the casket as a whole? Do the images together add up to one single coherent message? Or should we interpret them separately, divided up by the physical shape of the casket into self-contained narratives? Does each picture bring us closer to the divine? Or is it only after contemplating all the separate stories that we can hope to find a meaning that transcends mundane human existence? We could look for patterns and contrasts. For the distinction between vendetta on the left of the front panel and gift-giving on the right. Between the bad lordship exercised by the king who imprisoned Wayland and the good lordship of Christ. Between the son of Wayland and Beadahild, conceived through rape, and the son of God, born to a virgin mother. Between foundling twins suckled by a wolf, and the Christ child nursed by his human mother. Between the temple of Jewish worship, and the temple of Christ's body. But we can also find synthesis, a deliberate fusing of native Northumbrian traditions with those of Rome and of Jewish and Christian tradition. Is this casket material evidence of the holding on to aspects of the Anglo-Saxon's pagan past, even to continuity in pagan ritual and the worship of a pantheon of gods? In the year 797, an English cleric at the Frankish court called Alcuin wrote critically to an English bishop, castigating him for allowing his household to listen to pagan songs during dinner instead of having sacred readings. What, Alcuin demanded, has Ingeld, a legendary heroic figure, to do with Christ? Had he known of the decorative scheme of this casket, Alcuin, Alcuin might equally have asked, what has Wayland to do with Christ? Other than the suggestion already made, that Wayland stands here as Christ's antithesis, the answer that Alcuin would like us to give is none. But that doesn't help us make sense of the complex decorative scheme of the Frank's casket as a whole. Nor am I convinced that we should read this as evidence of the failure of the nominally converted English to abandon their pagan past with its pantheon of gods and heroes. 
Instead, I think we should contrast the past histories depicted around the casket, the stories from ancient Rome, those of the Jews and of the pagan forebears of the early medieval English, with the present and future tense relevance of the Incarnation. That event inaugurated a new promise of salvation for all humanity, pointing towards a future to which the Christian English now found themselves heirs. By including narratives from earlier cultures around the casket, the designer didn't merely assimilate into one place different strands of the Anglo-Saxon's cultural heritage. He demonstrated in word and image how all those pasts were essential elements of the present that the casket and its viewers now inhabited. All these narratives, the founding of Rome, the fall of Jerusalem, the stories of Wayland and of the sorrowing female figure on the lid, they all contributed materially to the shaping of Anglo-Saxon Christian culture. None could be denied, written out of the story or forgotten. But in the light of the incarnation of Christ, all these pasts acquired a different meaning, one that resonates for us too. Last time I saw a replica of this casket displayed in a Perspex case in a museum exhibition, I found myself returning repeatedly to this front panel, my eyes drawn to the Virgin and Child. This depiction of the light that has come into the world speaks as directly to us as it did to the casket's first viewers. This is Emmanuel, God with us, the defenceless infant before whom kings bowed in honour. Yet this is also the God who will be despised and rejected, tortured and hung on a cross. The same God who is the living bread come down from heaven, whose flesh is the bread given for the life of the world. As we look at the bread cast before his mother on the ground, we cannot but recall our unworthiness even to gather up the crumbs under his table. Yet his promises resonate as powerfully for Christians today as they did for the Anglo-Saxons. We, too, are social constructs and carry our own historical and cultural baggage, which has served to shape and form who we are now. But the truth of Christ incarnate never changes. Amen. <laughs>